Well, hello there and welcome to Developer's Guide to Windows 10 Insider Preview. I'm Andy Wigley, I'm here with Jerry Nixon. It's day number two, Andy. I'm excited about covering it, all this. Yeah, and we've got some great content uh, to start off with where we're looking at the adaptive design, adaptive UI, adaptive code. This is all about taking your one app and making it adapt well to run across different devices, different screen sizes, and incorporate different code for different device families. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that's all about the new universal Windows platform apps. We certainly had a design language that you would build your app to um, in Windows 8, right? We knew what that looked like, and it had specific qualities and characteristics. Some of those have changed. Many of them have not. Some of those have changed in Windows 10, and we can want to kind of walk through some of the thinking behind it, go through the... A, the, the, the principles and the concepts of those as well. So this is, really isn't a technical session as much as it is a, um, an alignment session so we can all see how we visually align and conceptually align with other apps and the core operating system in Windows 10. Yeah. This is a design course by developers for developers. Yeah. Now, of course, you're all Windows insiders, so you're all running Windows 10 already. And you'll have seen the new style, the kind of different fonts, the different icons that you're, you're seeing built into the first party apps. So this is a kind of about how do you get that same look and feel into your own apps. That's right. And so casually, we refer to this as the Microsoft design language. And so these are all of the concepts go into one thing. What is that thing? It's the MDL, the Microsoft design language. And um, anyway, so that's our internal t term for it. In fact, you see it kind of show up in some of our font names as well. You'll see the Sego MDL2 assets, right? What's that MDL? That's the Microsoft design language. Why is it two? Well, because we had the first one in Windows 8, and this is the, the rev of it. So specifically, we'll be talking about the uh, Microsoft design language, and then we'll move into some, sort of how we're making design even easier. We had a lot of conventions in Windows 8. They're even better in Windows 10 and a lot of technical things that genuinely makes it easier. Then kind of what am I designing and some, kind of a walkthrough right there and some techniques for adaptation because these are some new concepts that we didn't have before in Windows 8. That is the ability to run on almost any crazy shaped device that Windows can run on, which is basically everything. I mean, that's what we're seeing. Yep. It seems like every day we're announcing a new type of device yep. that Windows can run on, and your app, as a result, can run on it as well. So we'll talk about strategies around that, too. Make sense to you? It certainly does. All right, so this is the Microsoft design language, and I think it makes sense, perhaps. Let's just begin with some principles around it. And so um, we had principles in the design language in Windows 8. and it, fundamentally, those have not changed at all. Nothing has changed between them as far as conceptual. But it is nice to kind of talk about things in a way that kind of brings them home. So the first one is that the fact that we keep them simple. And things just work for the user. What we don't want to create is a sophisticated workflow that they need to figure out and work through inside your application. What is an app inside, what is a Microsoft app, a, a modern app kind of feel like? Well, I'll tell you what it feels like. It feels simple to use. You walk in and it's very intuitive. Also, it's the idea of universal, right? Yeah. You're the universal, yeah, universality? <laughs> universality, know, the, the adjectival yeah. form yeah. of universal. Yeah. Of, uh, and this, you know, this is kind of yeah. This is kind of about making sure that the uh, the user remains the center of the experience. Yeah. You know, we're creating apps that's going to run on a user's multiple devices. We want to make sure that they get a great experience, whichever device they pick uh, pick up. And so, you as creating an app, you need to kind of you need to buy into this and think think about universal and think yeah. about how how you're going to address a user's. Uh, needs on different devices, whether it's a one-handed phone, a bigger tablet, or a PC with a mouse and keyboard. Uh, you know, think about this. And it's a little bit of, there's two ways of looking at it, too. There's, well, the first one is every device should, you should try to get to every device. That doesn't mean your application targets every device. That's not what I mean. But, you know, I mean, I, I, it's difficult for me to write my application so that it runs on a low-end phone. Well, that's not really creating a universal experience. What I want to do is I want to try and tailor it to where I need to go. So the idea is you have an application and you're trying to make it for everyone, right? That is really where you're headed to. That includes things like localization, globalization as well, but it certainly is a technical issue as well. So what we aren't, what this doesn't begin to say is write an application that runs on everything. What we are saying is definitely write your application so that wherever your user is, they can have the experience that's, that's right for your app. Yep. The other is this idea of design as one. So designing as one really means to leverage all of the ecosystem inside the Windows 
store, right? There's many other applications, but there are many other technologies and capabilities as well. Don't make your application not leveraged to make the users a better experience. And a perfect example of this is inking. Inking is available across the entire platform now. It would not make sense for your application not to include inking if that would be a natural modality for it as well, right? So win is one, this sort of idea, design is one, bring in everything that's there so that it feels like a full application. And also make it personal, right? This is, this is something that yeah. I don't just shove it on the user. And so yeah. here's my app, Andy, make it work for you. I try and make it so that you can feel like this app was made, made just tailored for you. It's like yesterday I went to get a coffee in the coffee machine and I came back and I said, you know what, that machine, it goes away, away forever and at the end of it, it says, end of cycle. I said, well, that was a UI that was built by a hardware engineer, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, you know. You don't feel like it was speaking right to you? It, I, no, I didn't. That's the problem. Yeah. Well, it, well, to me, yes, I understood. But yeah, this is it. You know, make sure, make, be friendly and be, think of the user. And it, right. it should have said, your coffee is ready. Enjoy. And it rolls into the last principle that we'll talk about here. And, and uh, that's the idea of creating delight, right? Uh, making your application a kind of pleasure. Certainly, you have used an application that you hate. Right? So we know the anti-pattern here easily. Applications that don't work just right, or uh, or filling out a form on the web, and it and I put in my phone number, and I have to put the dashes. But on the next app, I don't have to put the dashes. Yeah. All that sort of craziness. Why make it harder on the user when you can make it so much? easier because it just works. And so it's this idea of simple and delight and all of this personal interaction as well. That's really what it's about. It's a lot less about how, how big the margins are. It's a lot less about what colors you use, right? That's really not the design language core. The core is the experience for the user. Right? All right, I think that makes sense. All right, let's start with typography. So there have been some changes in the typography that we're using in Windows 10. Um, one thing to say, the Sago font has not changed. We still are using Sago, um, but we see the type ramp changing a little bit, and uh, it's getting smaller. That really is kind of where it drills into. In fact, if there is sort of a theme, it's that things are getting tighter, thinner, yeah. you don't see as much white space, you don't see as, as large a margins, things yeah. like that, and maximizing kind of, space. I was just kind of thinking, you know, using these light fonts, it's much crisper, and that's kind of, kind of can, that also ha is happening with the hardware, isn't it? Screens tend to be getting higher, mm. higher resolution. You're getting crisper displays, and uh, this kind of crisp typography really works well on, looks really nice on those screens. So that's kind yeah. of where we're going. As a designer, there's no reason, or as a developer, let's say, there's no reason for you to memorize all of these ramps, of course, because they're built into XAML for you. But as a, de as a designer, you might use them as a reference. But where do you start? What's the default? Well, typically, for most techs, we're going to use 15 point Sago UI. So Sago UI regular is just Sago UI. And so this is 15 EPX. So that's not point, is it? It's pixels and it's effective pixels, which is something we'll talk about in just a few slides. But it, nonetheless, 15 is the size. And as you select the points inside your XAML uh, designer, it's automatically going to use effective pixels for you anyway. Yep. So we also have a handful of new uh, icons and symbols. So uh, around iconography, that certainly is one thing that has changed. You yeah. don't see circles around buttons and things that were kind of iconic <laughs> in uh, Windows 8. But uh, what you do see is a lot thinner. So now it's a two-pixel line that kind of draws them. And we still have Sago UI symbols, that font that was there with all those glyphs still exists. Those haven't really been tweaked. What, what instead, we've introduced a second font called Sago MDL2 Assets. Yep, and all these nice icons you can see on the, on the slide here. Uh, you'll find all of those in, in that font set and you can use them in, in your own uh, text. Typically, though, but app bar buttons and things, it has an icon property. You can just name the symbol that you want, and it will pick the right one directly straight out of that icon set. Thinner lines, a little bit tighter when it's drawn, relying on some high resolution, but also um, a smaller margin. So just generally, we minimize the white space between elements, right? This is very different from Windows 8, actually, where things were spaced a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. That's not the approach now, right? Where things are getting tighter to maximize the space, not crowd things. That's totally not the same concept. This is really just not overdoing white space. I think maybe that went just a little overboard in Windows 8. And it, you say things like, you know, make sure there's plenty of breathing room, and all of a sudden there's too much space. So yep. uh, this is just a, a reminder to bring things together to use space appropriately. Now, there is a magic number in Windows 10, and it's not 10. No. No, it's not. It's 4. And so the base of everything, 
now is four. We have a, a effectively a, a four-point grid so that everything moves inside a four-point yeah. Four pixel grid. So your margins should, in spacing between elements, uh, in general, I mean, rules are there to be mm. broken, but in general, you should do, use multiples of four. That's right. Yeah. And what was it we had in eight? We had uh, five. Uh, this is a little bit of a shift, isn't was, it? I, I actually believe it was ten. Ten on, yeah, okay. And that's the, one of the reasons there was there so go. much space, right? Because yeah. everything started really large. Yeah. And so now you'll see the grid view, and the grid view will have... Um, it will have four pixels between it, you know, or eight pixels between it, or it will have 12 pixels. And you'll see that lots of all the default margins and spacing all have some multiple of four. That really plays out nicely when you look at effective pixels and the, the subclass, not subclassing, subpixeling, so that you get less and less blur. So four is a great number to use. And if you're wondering, wow, I wonder how, how far off that is or what the spacing is, usually it's a multiple of four. So do your uh, multiplication tables, and you can start guessing the size and the layout of things. And yours should probably follow the same, so it has that visual alignment and feels like it's part of the ecosystem. This is just an example of uh, some of the, the red lines that we have for um, the split view. And you can see just everything is a multiple of four. We have 12 pixels here, 48 pixels here, 16 pixels here, and it just kind of goes from there. So just an example of how things are laid out using the magic number of four. So we also have colors, and there are quite a few variety of colors. And it's important to know that there are three primary colors. Well, that, I just shouldn't have used the word primary. There are three colors. There is the, well, primary color of your application, the secondary color of your application, and then the, the, uh, the accent color. So the, remember, just like on Windows Phone, that's brought over to Windows now, so you have the accent color that you can leverage. That's the, it's not called accent, it's called the system chrome accent or something like that. Anyway, all three of those are the three that you see are uh, kind of showing up. Those are not the three that, the, the accent color you don't have to use, that's all optional to you. But that primary and secondary color you're going to create, those are all up to you, right? You don't say, let's use whatever the primary color is. You decide that, but think about uh, high contrast screens when you do, because you want to make sure your application is still accessible to your entire audience. Then how do you create these variants? These derivatives of those colors are all based on, and this is kind of shows the ramp, uh, adding a little bit of white, so that you know, 0, 10, 20, 30, and 40% on white, or 0, 10, 30, or 0, 10, 20, 30, 40% of black. And that creates those subtle derivatives that you see for things like hover, mouse over, selected, pieces like that. How do, the, how do our apps create it? Now you kind of see a little bit of how the sausage is put together and the logic behind it as well. Pretty nice. All right, so that's just a high-level skim yeah. of the Microsoft design language. So what, what does the platform give us now to help us create apps that, to, that look great on Windows 10? A lot, I think, is the quick answer. The first thing that we see is we get adaptive controls. So the, uh, an adaptive control like this, so this is the command, the command bar. And so the same command bar on both phone and on desktop. And you see they really do look alike, but they certainly aren't identical, right? That's really nice. So um, the way that secondary commands appear, you know, is, is great because that, that's not how secondary commands were on Windows 8. Now they come in a fly up that, that remind or a fly out that reminds us of how Windows Phone works. However, it's tailored to the desktop, so it doesn't go all the way across the screen. In your mind, you might think, man, I wish it went all the way across the screen so it was identical to phone. And it turns out that it doesn't look right, especially on a really large monitor to have it come up like that. So the design team has brought those aspects on both sides, right? Bringing things from phone that people really loved and bringing things from desktop over to phone that people really loved, but making sure they're tailored properly for each. The takeaway here is, though, that these are standard controls that automatically adapt. You as a developer don't have to do anything. It automatically adapts depending on the device family that it's running on. That's the first thing that you have for building a develop, uh, a, an adaptive control, the fact that many controls adapt automatically. Yep. And I guess the, the next thing as well is thinking about the, these controls, the built-in controls, are pretty smart about what you're using to interact with the app. So we've got this, uh, they've got input intelligence. So you can see there, we've got two versions of um, a drop-down menu. Yep. 
Um, and the left one, you can see, is much more compact because the, uh, the, the system knows at that time you are using a mouse. So it knows that the hit points, the touch area, doesn't need to be quite so big. Right. So it displays it more compact, which is appropriate for a mouse and not wasting loads of white space and uh, spacing them out too far. And then the one on the right is actually might have come up on a, a tablet or uh, on a phone. So it knows that you're using touch. And the, now you've got big hit targets so you can, mm -hmm. easily, you can easily hit a menu item with your finger. And then look at the calendar there as well. The one on the left, again, knows that it's, uh, it's being used by, uh, for a mouse. So we've got a nice mouse up and down to allow you to scroll the list easily. Uh, but over on the right, it's, it's just, we're just using finger to scroll the, the list up and down. Uh, so you don't need these little adornments to, to help you navigate it. It's interesting to think about size. So that's, that hit target is really important. And one of the things that, that impacts the hit target size is the scaling algorithm of Windows. Now, we introduced the scaling algorithm in Windows 8.1, but nothing like, nothing like the sophistication in the, in the heuristic for Windows 10. And so the idea is, and you can sort of see it here, when a user looks at a device, the device isn't at the same distance from them. So in this case, you can see they're looking at their phone at maybe 16 inches. So that's, you know, the, maybe the, just holding it in your hand. And then where is your desktop? Maybe that's at 20, maybe 28 inches. And then that your Xbox experience, you, know, you don't hold that in your hand, obviously. That's on your wall, and that's maybe at 120 inches. Or, you know, it's 10 feet away, or you don't know what it is, right? But whatever that is, each piece has a different viewing distance, and now Windows needs to account for that so that the user's experience inside your application matches the distance, this viewing distance, of whatever device that they're on. That is how we use the scaling algorithm. So for example, I'll have my application on a phone, but I'll also have it on an Xbox. Now, the font size that I use, I can't sniff for everything and, and change everything about my application. What I really want is for my application to scale properly as it goes over to the Xbox. So that's what it does. As it goes over the Xbox, the Xbox applies a scale factor. Let's say it's two times scale factor. I'm not quite sure what it might be, but whatever that is, brings it so that my experience is identical, and I think Maybe visually it'll make more sense to see. I have a video here that kind of draws it out and you'll be able to see what the scaling factor does for us. All right, so this is a one by 100 by 100, some 100 point font uh, here as well, and then here's some 24 point font. This is my application, just to keep it simple like that. Here it is on a television or Xbox, a tablet, and a phone. So it's 100 by 100, but the, you can still see the scaling factor is applied, and it's actually larger on all of the others. It looks like they don't really match anymore. Is it just a zoom factor, and how does the scaling, how does the scaling algorithm kick in here? Well, if we stop holding them side by side, but instead look at them relative to their, their viewing distance from the user, it makes a little bit more sense, right? Where one is a little farther than the other, when you look at them relative, or from that perspective, suddenly your application is actually the same size. Your font is actually the same size. So it allows developers to use the same font size, the same scale, the same shapes and size and layout, no matter where it is, so they can give the same experience to the user, all because of the scaling algorithm that's completely automatic. Don't pay attention to it. Just know that it's there. Don't try and measure for it. Just know that it's there, and the system will take care of the rest for you. How does your app look? How does a tiny little app that you have on a phone look really great on an Xbox? The scaling algorithm. Yeah, and so yeah, the, so the takeaway is really yeah, you can put some 24-point uh, text on a screen, um, and the user it's going to look similar size whether it's displayed on a phone or on a, a tablet, PC, or on a on a wall-mounted screen. Yeah. So the next, and the next very important, and we've talked about this concept of effective pixels. We've called them many different things throughout the years. Even, even WPF started with effective pixels, um, but they, what did we call them? We called them device independent units or something like that. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, anyway, here's the idea. I draw a box or, or some sort of rectangle on this left section, right? And um, as resolution goes higher, then my box gets smaller because I'm saying something like, I want this to be 100 by 100 pixels, physical, physical pixels. pixels. Yeah. So as I get to a more dense device, then my, obviously it would, get, it would get physically smaller, but still be 100 pixels by 100 pixels. 
That's a real problem because we have so many devices and so many um, resolution densities that you have to measure constantly for that. So instead, we use effective pixels. So effective pixels, you can see here on the right, I say I want it to be 100 by 100, and as the phone's physical density increases, the, the number of pixels also is increasing. You can see that the rectangle stays the shape and size that you want it to be, so it is a device independent resolution is really what kind of what we're talking about. This isn't the scaling factor, right? It's not scaling. It's actually drawing the, the pixel as an effective virtual pixel. And maybe a graphic here will make it a little bit more sense. So this is my grid um, that I see because so I'm going to draw some I'm going to draw that red rectangle that we saw on the previous screen. Well, there's only one physical pixel down here in the corner. So the whole thing is 16 physical pixels. But if I drew it as a single pixel, it would be so tiny that you wouldn't see it. The effective pixel is actually this 4x4 four four that makes it 16 in size. Now, it's the system that's doing all this calculation. It's the system that's figuring out the density. It's the system that determines what, how big an effective pixel is so that it's guaranteed that the application sizes properly from here to there. So as you're designing your application, ignore scale. As you're designing your application, ignore resolution. And as you're designing your application, don't pay attention to DPI because effective pixel is the is the umbrella for everything. It's this abstract. It so yeah. It's an abstract pixel system. Just allows you to to just ignore the the uh, the, the hardware resolutions of your screens and and the distance of the viewing distance of the for the user. So, so those are the things that um, you get for free, right? Those are why is how can we design all these different devices and make it easy? Well, the reason is we give you this scaling factor built in, and the reason is we give you effective pixels to design to. That means when you do that, you design to one scale or one system, and uh, it, you know that it will look proper on all of the others. You don't get these weird things that you see sometimes on other platforms. But there's a, so there's other things to think about. So yeah, we've made it easy for you to put uh, font, uh, use font sizes and, and, and sizing of spacing of items. It's going to give the same effect on each screen. Doesn't mean you want to show exactly the same thing on each screen. So you need to start thinking also about adapting your UI so that you give a great user experience, which is appropriate for what the user is, the device the user is using, mm -hmm. um, and the orientation of the screen, whether it's portrait or landscape. And of course, that's going to differ from a, a phone, which you pull out and use in a, for a quick, a short um, user interaction, to a longer interaction on a bigger screen like a like a laptop or PC. So you've been asked to go ahead and create the user interface for your application. You know that you want it to look great, but what are you designing? What are you actually going to have to create here? Because let's think about the ecosystem of Windows, and surely this even isn't enough. But let's just look at this. How many different screens, orientations, how many different aspect ratios, on and on we go, are you going to have to design in order for your application to have really a tremendously valuable experience for the user? All of these? Maybe. Not likely. That certainly isn't the approach that we take internally. We're not designing a, 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 an experience unique to every screen here because we trust in the system's ability to respond and scale. So instead, we, we approach it with three. So we say, okay, there is going to be a narrow portrait experience, and we'll call that the phone experience. And we'll start with the five-inch experience. So I will, I will design a mobile experience that's portrait and, and narrow, but I'll also move out of phone quickly and go into a tablet experience. So I'm still a touch mode, right? That's the idea. I'm still running mobile. Um, but I'll start with the 8-inch because the 8-inch makes the most sense for me to begin to. And then I'll also go over to laptop. So this at 13 inches. Each of those will be in landscape mode. What that means to me is I am designing three designs, right? Each one a subtle variant of the next. And I'm not designing what could have been. 12 designs, yep. and if we had just brainstormed a little more, 112 designs. Well, yeah, so it, it's, and obviously these are guidelines, so your, your mileage may differ, but this, this is a good, a good starting point to think about those three discrete, those distinct user scenarios that's really going to cover the 95% the 
potentially of your your use cases. That's that. the goal, right? Yep. To try and cover as much as you can by designing as little as you can. Yeah, I can see the situation now where some director in your company comes in and has just bought this fantastic six and a half inch phone, and they say, eh, you know, they want the custom UI just for their phone. So that that will be the the fourth design you have to do. <laughs> Perhaps yes. <Yeah. laughs> Although we'll talk about some techniques that you can use as as, as a designer and developer to make it so that your application might actually work for that six inch phone that, did, that, that your executive just bought. And so we have these three designs, and are they unique, or better said, are they distinct and separate? No, probably not. This is probably what we're designing, a single UI that will apply what we call snap points or break points, and that's where it suddenly changes. And so maybe this graphic will help kind of describe it. So your UI will change in width, so we're specifically talking about width, and to be very clear, we're talking about effective pixel width. And so the system will tell you how wide it is, and it may not actually match the width and, den and pixel density of a screen. That's, be that's on purpose, right? Because everything is effective pixels. So it, when effective pixels goes down to 320, which I think is our most narrow possible. Uh, yep. um, that's the minimum, view, minimum effective pixels width. Yeah. On the phone, right? So now you're, you're building for the right. smallest common denominator. So that's perfect. It's, I don't know if the, the smallest common denominator. I, IoT maybe smallest, smallest width, yeah. yeah, for the phone. And then, um, then we have another breakpoint. So skip the second one and just go straight to 720. So now we've moved into um, a phablet or a tablet, you know, that tablet mode. A phablet could be a really large phone, I suppose, or a relatively small tablet. And then you're designing for that up to, and then you handle this 1024, right? So now I've got two breakpoints, perhaps three, where I go from 320 to 720 all the way up to 10, 1024. And what I'm basically saying is, when do I move in between my different designs? This is when you move in between your different designs, which means the design that you're creating should account for the vari variation in between those. So I've got this range, and I know that my design is in this range, so I want to test across the entire range. And uh, let's see, I have, uh, we have some, some samples here to, to, that we'll walk through, but let's talk about how we handle this range. So as your application gets a little bit larger, we're going to change the flow of the application. So, um, for example, so now you can see these three that we had talked about, the 5-inch, uh, the 8-inch, and the 13-inch. And I've got my UI, and I've got more space as I've got larger screens. And as I have larger screens, obviously what we're not doing is making our UI fatter. We're not trying to just fill the space. I mean, sometimes that is an option. If I have a game that is a chessboard, right? Yep. Uh, obviously, I am going to try and fill more, just let it be a little bit larger. I'm not going to add an additional row or column to my chessboard. That really doesn't make sense. But here I am in the design, but, I, and, but how do I kind of handle these variations? Well, what I will do is I'll just, I'll just include uh, these different sections around it so I can start to see. So on phone, it's really perfect. I'm going to design the perfect experience for a 5-inch phone. I'm not going to design my experience around a 4-inch phone. But I am going to look at what my app looks like on a 4-inch phone so I can start to see if there needs to be some shifting around. I'm not clipping so it's totally unusable. So I go ahead and, and start implementing things like, like a little bit of variation in size perhaps or maybe just making sure that I use um, percentages and, and instead of um, straight pixels. And then I go up a little and you see that at the bottom of the graphic where I even go up to see, well, what would this look like on a 6-inch phone? And so I, this is for testing, but not for design. Well, it is for design, of course, but I want to make sure that I, it looks right on all of them. Then I move over into my tablet. Obviously, I'm not copying it one-to-one. -one. It's going to be slightly changed there as well. And it's, it's worth saying about that, that graphic you can see there with the image and then the text flowing to the right. So uh, we're, not, we're not diving down into actual XAML techniques, but uh, Jerry mentioned uh, um, percentages there. So yeah. you could typically lay that out as a, a grid and say, OK, for this, this small phone portrait kind of layout, yeah. then we want the image to take up 50% of the screen and the, the, the text to the right of it to be the other 50% of the screen. And by doing it in percentage ways like that, rather than, than hard coding your effective pixel sizes, then you automatically get that view adapting nicely
nicely to the four inch phone, the four and a half inch screen, and it still obviously looks great on the five inch and looks great on a five and a half. So you, you get right. you, the, 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 the XAML will give you this kind of flow layout to the things to help you make a good, uh, good view on each of those different screens. That's right. You're really designing three different UIs, but you're making sure that each of them can meet the needs of the of the range can, can of size. And adapt to those ranges, yeah. That's right. So there are a couple other things that you, as you design, get to think about, right? And so uh, one of them is we want to adapt to this size and change. That's very important, obviously, what we just talked about. But we also want to adapt to the input change. So as the user um, puts their mouse down and starts to use a pen, as the user uh, is, is kind of drawn into your application to start using touch all of a sudden, you might need to make some changes. So perhaps some things move out, spread out just a little bit, or maybe even tighten up. You show a couple new affordances that you didn't have before because you need that with a mouse or you need that with a, a touch input. Another thing to remember is effective pixels is the only way to go. Don't start trying to measure and calculate all of the pixels, with an exception if you're writing a ruler app. <laughs> yeah. I suppose you do want to do that because you want it to be absolutely perfect size. But after that, you can just trust the system to properly scale and properly determine the effective pixel for your application. You build it out, set it up, and just know it looks proper on all of the other systems, and just rely on that scaling algorithm. Okay, now where do you start, right? We start with design it's techniques, <laughs> right? See, so we have, uh, we have uh, several different approaches that we'll, we'll go through, and we'll kind of just talk about those. And remember, this isn't a technical session. This is a conceptual session. So we'll, let's look at these conceptually. And so we, we categorize these into three, three areas. And the first is what we just spoke about. That is the responsive design. That's, that's uh, resizing and reflowing your content ever so, so subtly. And uh, we've learned a lot of these techniques um, because we're building websites that do the same thing. We didn't have this issue um, so much in Windows 8 because we couldn't, um, we couldn't resize at such a granular level as we can now in Windows 10 where we can window our apps and then resize to whatever it is we want to, snap them and everything else. Right? And so now we get to do that. We also ad have adaptive design. So we have responsive and then we have adaptive design. Adaptive design means we're going to change our UI in response. So now I'm responding. It's getting more and more narrow, but reality is I just don't have space anymore. Now I need to move things around. That's adaptive design. And then finally, sometimes there's a tailored design. So I build an application and I'm going to run it on both a phone and an Xbox, let's just say. The correct thing to do for my application might be just to scale properly. But the correct thing to do for your application might actually be to create a tailored design specific for that device. So you create a UI specific for the phone, but then you maybe create one specific for Xbox or or HoloLens, or yeah. you name whatever it is. And there's, there's no one rule for this, so you have to look at your your app and your your use case, your scenario, and pick the techniques that are going to work best for you. Right. So this this video sort of shows how I could resize, right? So this is just me handling the screen. So it changes in size, gets a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. That's our responsive. And then we could also, in the responsive category, we could reflow as well. And so this is just, you can see it responds, and then it just makes it one column it's, instead of two, just shifting things just ever so slightly. And so a lot of this can be done with very simple programmatic things that you, you can just hide it. That column vanishes because it doesn't have size. Yeah. And we're going to look at some good techniques in the next session on, on how you actually do this in a, in a Right, this isn't way. a technical session, but we're yeah. loaded with technical sessions. So just stay tuned, and we'll show you how to do all this with your uh, inside XAML. So here's another one. So this is inside uh, the uh, adaptive display, right? So this is me repositioning. So you can see A and B are side by side. But as it gets more narrow, I need to move B below A in order to make it work. Easy enough, right? And, we, and this is just another technique that we can kind of include. So this is response, well, this is repositioning, but we can also redesign. And so sometimes it, you have to do dramatic things where we're not just moving things around. It genuinely changes depending on what's happening. So you can see there, that the UI itself has a different way of interacting because there's no longer room for it. You see this in the Outlook app, yeah. the Outlook app on the phone. 
versus the Outlook app on on a display. You know, it's many columns. Yeah, you on look, the phone, you, they, they're almost stacked columns. That's right. You'll often get this with uh, an app that's got a fairly rich UI, a lot of information to 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 give to the user. Um, where you and the phone, this is where you start thinking about. Oh, okay, a phone tends to be uh, information snacking. It tends to be short interactions. So you you will change what you <laughs> yeah, what you will change what what are the primary uh, selectors that you're showing to the user on the phone compared to what you're showing. Would you show time. them a menu for the snacking app? Yeah, <laughs> you probably would, Jerry. <laughs> you probably would. Yeah. Um, well, uh, so take this away, right? So that's a lot of different techniques. But you want to combine those techniques, and you want to do what's appropriate for your design. So I'm not saying reflow your application. I'm not saying build one specific for Xbox. I'm saying there's a lot of approaches, and you as the designer slash developer, a dev designer, you get to decide on which one really suits your needs. So there's a lot of approaches. The great news is the tooling, the framework, and the platform support all of them so you can easily develop and deliver a beautiful experience to users without right. compromising the experience. That's right. Okay, so what have we gone through here? Um, we've gone through the, the design language itself. So there are some changes from Windows 10. The fact that it's slightly more compact, the, slightly it's, the, the fact that it's slightly uh, more narrow, and the lines are a little tighter and things like that. But fundamentally, it hasn't changed at all. And then we also talked about how we make it easier for developers by giving them all the tooling that they need, things like a scaling algorithm that just works, things like effective pixels that takes away the need to ask what device am I on and what size is it and all these other pieces. That's beautiful. But we've also given you this, um, th this set of techniques. So what am I designing? We know that we can start at three designs. That's what we're doing internally at MS Design, right? And so we started these three designs to try and hit the broadest reaches we can. And if we are missing one that's vital to your application, obviously you would include that as well. And then finally, we talked about the techniques, things that we've learned because we're web developers as well, right? Things that we know we can reposition and resize, reflow. We can do basically this responsive design. We can do this adaptive design. And then we can reach out to tailored design if we need to. So that tailored design basically is saying, yep. build it for any device specifically if it's just not working. Beautiful. Because yeah. the end, the goal is the user experience. So we hope you're feeling uh, excited about uh, the the challenge ahead of you about creating great UIs that's going to work across different devices. But whether you're excited or you're feeling slightly daunted, yes. in the very next session, we're going to uh, start looking into actually how you do this kind of thing in XAML. So the great, some have got some great new controls and some new techniques that help you to create these adaptive and uh, responsive designs. That's right. Go get yourself a drink. We will see you in just a few minutes.